Okay. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Um, today we're going to be covering the findings from our survey of uh, current and prospective uh, students in online and non-traditional programs. Uh, so the report that this is based on is actually uh, very excited to announce that will be available for download after the webinar. So um, stick around and we'll give you information about uh, receiving that, that download um, afterwards. You'll get that in an email um, once the recording is available. So uh, we're going to, uh, to go ahead and get started here. And um, we've got a lot of information to cover, so we're gonna jump right into it here. Um, first, just a little bit about us um, and this poll here. Um, so we are Education Dynamics. Uh, if you are aware of us, you probably know that we are a comprehensive uh, enrollment growth partner for colleges and universities. We've got everything from full service marketing agency services to market research like we're going to be discussing today, um, a fully uh, US-based contact center and inquiry generation resources and, and a lot more. So uh, happy to discuss that with you a bit more if you're interested, but want to share most of the time today to uh, discuss Carol's findings. So with that, with that, let me go ahead and introduce Carol. If you do have questions for Carol as we are moving through the webinar, please feel free to enter them into the chat or the Q&A pods. Um, we will go ahead and have some time set aside at the end for Q&A, but I may stop um, if there's something that's timely that we wanna get to immediately, I may stop Carol. For the most part though, we're going to leave those questions at the end. If we don't have time uh, to get to all of the questions at the end, we will be happy to reach out to you and and further those conversations afterwards. So please do use that Q&A. Uh, we will monitor that and, and make sure that we do our best to answer as many of those questions as we can. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carol. Uh, Carol Slanian is a longtime nationally recognized speaker and an authority on higher education. Um, she is an authority on students that enroll in non-traditional programs. Uh, she's done a number of surveys like the one that we're going to be speaking about today and really has a, a firm grasp and understanding of who these students are, what their preferences are, and, and how that's changed and moved over the, the course of the year. So I'm going to turn it over to Carol and um, Carol, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Oh, it's wonderful to be here with you. I've looked over the list of participants and so many good friends from near and far, hundreds of colleges, and we've even got representatives from South America and the Middle East. So I'm so glad you're tuned in today because I think the information I'm able to share that my staff and I have collected will be extremely important, more so now than ever before. And I think you'll find it worthwhile to begin uh, to think about what we now are going to call uh, the post-traditional student. Uh, it's not a great term. I wish we had something better, but this methodology uh, focuses on, and let me take a minute before we move to the next slide, it focuses on students who don't study full-time day and in residence. And believe me, folks, that I want to say 70% of all enrollments, but I'm going to be conservative and I'll say at least 50 to 60% of all enrollments in the United States is made up of students who do not study full-time during the day, classroom study, and in residence. So that's more than 50, 60%. Some people are saying 70. That's the population I want to talk to you about today because if it were 50% uh, six months ago, believe me, with our current situation, it's just going to grow because the learning styles of these post-traditional students is what we're conveying now to all students in terms of the ease and ability to get the education they want. So pay attention because I think the tactics and the characteristics and the, the ways to approach this population, which I will talk to you about, is exactly what you need for all students. So moving on, what we did, in the recent uh, months is to talk to 500 randomly selected undergraduate post-traditional and 400 graduate. So I have data on both undergraduate and graduate. And we have a national panel that we do these surveys with. We do them regionally for individual colleges. And now we did it nationwide so I could report to you as a group. To be post-traditional is any age you can be any age, you can be 18, you can be 32, and you can be 65, but you're not studying full-time during the day 
in a classroom setting and living on or near campus. And I won't get into the many, many articles we have facing us today about what is that population going to be doing this fall. And I think many of your institutions have already geared up to do the kinds of things we're going to talk about that were right for post-traditional are not going to be transferred over to the traditional market. And let me tell you something else about that marketplace. Way before the pandemic, last fall, we were talking over and over again about the declining numbers of high school graduate students. And that is because of demographics. You know, 18, 20 years ago, not as many births took place. So regardless of the pandemic and what it's done to learning styles and the ability to enter education, um, the demographics have, had already had an influence on the numbers of students in this category of traditional that we were going to be able to attract. So, so this is even more pertinent today than ever before. The other thing we, when we do in our national studies uh, is that we will only get data from, from those post-traditionals who are enrolled now in the last three years or have firm plans for the next 12 months. So we study demand and not need. And that many of you who know me, are, that's my endless statement, it's always about demand and not need. That is, they've done it, they are doing it, or they're going to do it, and we can rely on their advice. Oh, by the way, one other point. I, I was just reading uh, some literature. When we think about that 70% and 30%, if you look at Harvard University, I'll use them as an example. Harvard, well, before this spring or, or, or so, Harvard was entertaining roughly 10,000 students in its day program, full-time, in residence, traditional. What percent did it have in its continuing ed extension division? Try 17, 18,000. So those are the people we're talking about that have already uh, made an impact in our enrollment numbers, but now even more so. Okay, Eric. <laughs> so let's talk about these students. Who are they? It's very important to understand the demographics because when you pinpoint your marketing and you create your programs, you need to know what is the characteristics of this population. So I've had it both for the undergraduates and graduates. I'll go as quickly as I can so you can review this later in time. The average Median, I'm sorry, the median age of the undergraduates in post-traditional study is 31, but I do want you to pay attention to that under 25, uh, 20, uh, 16 percent. That is going to grow and grow and grow given our current circumstances, okay? So when we say learning doesn't predict, uh, age does not predict learning, this is a good example of that. We would have put those people in a category of traditional programs during the day, full time, but more and more that under 25 crowd is going to come to what we now call post-traditional study. And the median age, uh, no surprise for the graduate student, is about 33. So the, this information is good for you as you project uh, your, your marketing outreach and messaging and so forth. Moving on. Let's look at the undergraduate other de demographics. 65% of our post-trads at the undergraduate level are Caucasian, and we've got to do a lot better in incorporating and attracting minority students, which I think we'll have a better opportunity to do in the months ahead. Many of them are in need of the jobs that will give them the income that they might have just lost or expect to lose, and this is a great target. Uh, if we have 40 to 50% minority populations in the country today, we're not doing a good enough job in preparing these, these students for their next career and income increases. So we've got to do better on the, on the uh, ethnic background of our, our populations. In terms of uh, children, about uh, half of them have children in the household, half do not. Uh, most of them are women, but that's no surprise. I think in all enrollments, we're over 55% women, so we're women here as well. And uh, six, two thirds of them are married or have a partner. These are family people, and you'll soon see in the next chart uh, that they are also working. Uh, they're working full. Uh, ah, I, I've got to move that slide up a bit to say where we are here. Okay, um, they're employed and they're employed full-time folks. 73% are employed full-time, so guess what? They can't come day and study full-time and do the things you, you do with traditional students. And their median income is 72,000. Uh, I think the median income before the pandemic nationwide was about 54, 55,000. 
So they're a little bit above, but certainly not enough to pay the kinds of tuition you people have been asking for. So we'll see. Moving on, the graduate demographics. In fact, we're even more Caucasian with graduate students, which means here are opportunities to reach out to non-Caucasian populations. Uh, second, um, they uh, 50, half have uh, children, half do not. And 56%, even at the graduate level, are women. Okay, so that's standard. And they're married, two thirds are married. So these are working full time, uh, married people with children, busy lives, but have found a way to move into higher education to get the credentials they need to move on with their jobs. And you'll see shortly to increase their salaries. Again, uh, though the um, graduate student medium income is 81,000, again, with a family and children and the tuition costs I see today, that's not going to make it for many of them unless we do something drastic in terms of getting them more cost-effective education uh, options. And they too, of course, we know uh, graduate students are employed full-time. So I offer you these demographics so that when your marketing people reach out to these people, they'll know what to say in the right way to understand their lifestyles. So what appeals to them today in terms of what are they going to study? Or no, yeah, these are people who just did it. So what have they been studying? And this should be a profile that helps you, uh, you know, uh, uh, direct your, your options in the right way in terms of areas of study. No surprise, let's look down that undergraduate column, although it's pretty standard across graduate and, under, and undergraduate. And of course it's business, 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 number one. However, not number one if you look at computer science and IT and then go down a bit and look at science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, we're still almost tied with business, okay? And I can't see much difference in that other than to predict that the computer science and IT and uh, other digital like uh, programs will be on the increase given the changes we need to face now, given the recent um, uh, crisis. I also believe, and this is my personal opinion, given the, the regional studies we've been doing lately, uh, is that health and medicine will increase not only because of the pandemic, but in general, I think people are living longer, uh, need more help in their, in their health arenas. And uh, I think with the, with the th current crisis that health and, and medicine will increase. So in my opinion, uh, the big three will be computer science, business, and then health and medicine. So what are your, oh, this is for you, Eric. So this is just a quick poll that we're gonna pull up here. Um, we wanna hear from you. Uh, what, uh, what do you think the uh, expectations are for your program development for 2020, 2021? Do you anticipate that you'll be moving to uh, existing programs permanently online or will there be some other changes that you're making? We'll just give this a quick second and we'll, we'll share the results here. All right, we're getting a lot of great response to us here. Um, Can I check more than one? <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so it looks like it's starting to slow down a little bit. Let's go ahead and end the poll and share the results here. So Carol, have you got anything you wanna share about this? Well, uh, yeah, I've been doing a lot of reviews and it is a mixed bag, let me tell you. And looking at colleges from the Cal State system to Notre Dame to Purdue to small institutions like Iona, and not Iona, sorry, um, uh, Sacred Heart and others, um, they, I, I don't think we're really, and in Cornell University, my alma mater hasn't made a decision yet. They're still studying it. 
So I think we're on tiptoes right now in terms of exactly what we're going to do. And new changes, maybe new outbreaks of the virus and all will modify our opinion. My feeling is that we're going to uh, have some limited residence with a blended online format during the day. Okay, goals, motivations, and enrollment factors. What brings this 60 to 70% of college students who are not full-time day back to school? Let's find out. Okay, let's, um, for the undergraduates, oh gosh, I wanted to say this loud and clear. It's called revenue, money, income, pay, okay? Can you see that? These people are very determined to get a job that will increase their salary. And if they said this a few months back, guess what they're going to be saying today? They want to increase their salary. So I'm not saying that you should all, uh, and, and also transition to a new career, as you can see, a uh, second and third. Uh, they want advancement in their careers, and they really are wanting that advancement up because they love that new position as much as they think it'll bring them more income for their families, okay? So what are you going to do in your advertising and marketing to spell out the fact that this occupation will yield that and that occupation. I thought, I don't think you colleges want to do that. I don't think you want to relate study to income. But somehow, you have to understand their motivation. And their motivation to raise their salary will affect the way they want your education. But you should understand that they're looking for a position that takes them above where they are now. And the primary reason is salary. So whatever you can do to say, our institution understands this, we're ready to guide you, we're ready to service you, and put you in the right program to get what you want out of this uh, effort. Next. Reason for returning to school? Well, guess what's related? My financial situation changed. Folks, if I ask that question again today, it would be off the charts, all right? Everybody's financial situation has changed. And guess what they're going to do more and more? If your financial situation changes and you want more income and you know you've got to advance, where do you turn to? Your area, colleges, and universities. So I don't know how you're going to get this messaging across, but if you have good advertising people, if you have people who make good connections with your community, this is a primary motive. And in fact, your institution has to think hard and clearly about how you're going to help them with this because your competitors will see this as much as you and will find ways to announce, we can help you get there. So here we go. Back again to cost of tuition and fees. Now, uh, I just read an article last night that it's cost, cost, cost. And the colleges that are going to win out in the next six months to a, uh, a year are going to be those who can think of ways to reduce their tuition and fees and announce it as so. We understand what you've been through. We understand your job changes situation, your need for further income. And we have made a decision to modify our tuition and fees. They, we, just, we just did a study looking at why a certain college lost certain students and how good the, could they have kept them to enrollment. And the reason was they found a, le a similar program at a lesser cost. The major reason, cost, 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 and how it affects my income base. So my, it's, it's come out loud and clear. You've got to think of ways. And by the way, if, as people move more and more to online and blended, they're going to expect a little discount, okay? Not that we think that it's, that it's warranted, but they're gonna think that if they're not sitting in the classroom in the evening or late afternoons or on a weekend, and that is saving you guys money. So if you're bringing it inside with in online education, they're accepting some reduction. Another way to handle this, however, is a question we didn't ask, but I've asked it on many of our area surveys, and that is, would a, would a small scholarship make a difference in considering our institution rather than the one across the street? And the answer is absolutely yes. A 500 little scholarship announced in your material and your brochures and whatever, on your website makes a huge difference. So think, so think of ways to show this respondent group that you are willing to help them make it through the cost of education by awarding scholarships, or in fact, stating that you're reducing your tuition. You've got to think about this hard and clear because that's your ace in the hole in beating the competition, I believe.
Next. This is it. This is it. I think we have a little more. Okay, student services. I, I wanna bring this up because again, we've been seeing it over and over again. Who thought that these busy, working, married, with children, people want career advice? But they uh, ignore library resources. That always comes out number one. I don't even have to mention it. But look at number two with uh, the undergraduates and three with the graduate students. It's called career planning and placement. Even though they may have a job or have expertise in a certain area, they're ready, willing, and able to listen to your advice about area employment, about what certain majors can lead you to, and so on and so forth. And what a great thing to advertise in your marketing. We help you think of your next career. And now we're on to another poll correct, uh, question, right, Eric? Yes, we also we often think of the undergraduate traditionals who need to think about where they're going next. But this returning population, as busy as they are and as connected to their uh, employment as they are, they want new career directions. And what a great thing to market, to entice them to your place and not your neighbors. And Carol, as we're waiting for this out, I just want to okay. about 20 minutes in, so we'll have to... Move, move on. Okay. Well, anyone who wants more information or anything, just uh, contact me and I'll be happy. I'll help you connect to others in, the, in our company or uh, answer your questions directly if you think you need more data or information or advice. All right, I'm going to end this poll here and share the results real quick. Looks like about 68% um, of the respondents said that they were um, providing career planning and placement. To the, the non-traditional populations. Very good. And, and that's something that you need to promote. And all right. Study formats. This is not going to be a big surprise to many of you. Let's look at the undergraduate column. Uh, this is what they did do. Remember, these are real learners. So we said, where, how did you enroll in that recent study of the last year or so? And 30% uh, were all online. Okay, so you have a market there, and it probably increases at this point. Um, high, low, low residence was next with 24%. That's, you know, a visit to campus periodically. We call that low residence. Hybrid, 15%. Uh, and then the mixture and classroom is uh, almost at the bottom with three others uh, classroom courses. So it's called online and hybrid and the same is true for the graduate students, okay? And so your new poll question. So we'll just take a few minutes here to. I'm sure the they're, they're now all engaging in all all aspects of uh, of formats. And Looks like 42% uh, of the participants right now are online or uh, only classroom courses. Uh, the rest wow. are either online courses or some blend. Well, we've got good advice, advice for that 42%, correct? Okay. Moving on, preferred weeks, I can, I can do that easily. Let's call it eight weeks undergraduate and 10 weeks graduate. Uh, any more than that for each population is not a great idea. In fact, even better is six to eight for an undergraduate and eight to 10 for graduate. No more than eight, no more than 10 for those populations. I think you know that by now. Let's talk about reaching out to these students with your marketing effort, efforts and your publicity and your advertising. Uh, hey, here's one. I think you've heard from our online college student report over and over again. We've been producing it for five years. 70% of post-traditional undergraduate students study within 
50 miles, uh, I'm sorry, study with a college within 50 miles or less of where they live. Likely the same true by about two percentage point difference for graduate students. What does it mean? Concentrate your marketing dollars, do your outreach, do your, uh, your fairs or whatever you wanna do within the vicinity of 100 miles or so. That's where your students of the post-traditional nature are coming from. You can concentrate your dollars, you can be more focused, and, on this, and as well, you know who your competition is. So get out there, look at what your competition is doing within a 100 mile radius, and also focus on the, on the students in that region. Now, that's not saying that some of you can't reach farther. If you have unique topics, or you have boutique topics, or niche topics, or you're the only one within you know, the region who does something, you can reach farther. But for business, computer science, and med health and medicine, believe me, they're coming from nearer populations than other. One exception, I noticed that today we have another, uh, a number of religiously based institutions, a Baptist, Lutheran, uh, evangelical, uh, Catholic nature, you might be able to reach out further because you have a particular population you can appeal to. Uh, uh, take Liberty, for example, with this online program, reaches all over the nation. So if you have a special interest or a character or a program uh, uh, topic, you can reach farther, but on the whole, the bread and butter accounts are coming within, you know, let's say 100 miles or so. Really, actually 50. <laughs> okay, here's a good one. Uh, and your recruitment staff needs to be aware of this. Most of these students, or at least half, okay, half are, appealing, are applying to only one institution. So don't ruin that opportunity. Get to them quickly. They want advice within a day or hours. They want reactions to financial aid assistance within days. So if there's only one out there, if they're only applying to you, you have it made. This is different than maybe your traditional undergraduate population where you have to offer discounts and other incentives. These people want you, you're the first and their only choice. So don't let them pass by more than a handful of minutes when they first come to you, okay? Very important to, to realize this. And I, actually the vast majority is one or two. Did you enroll at the first institution that you're admitted to? Guess what? Of course, 71 or 79% for a graduate. The reason is they only applied to one for most, and if they apply to two, the first one uh, that announces their admission gets, uh, gets, the, uh, gets to be the winner. Very, so this is critically important to your recruitment staff and how they behave and how they reach out and their, uh, their quickness. And we've done a lot of studies late, lately on lost customer kind of ideas. And the reason that they didn't apply to our client college is a lot has to do with the follow-up and offering of advice and, and the information they need to make a decision because it all has to do with finances to a large extent. So they need that information particularly early. Cord cutters, this is great. I had to use my millennial staff around me to get to this. So how many cord cutters do we have in this population? The use of um, how many people now using cable and satel satellite and at the undergraduate level, thir 32 a third do not and at the graduate level, a third do not, okay? So this is our new generation of students. They're not relying on cable and satellite as much as they are on, in the next slide, um, streaming media, for example. Uh, look at, I say, look at the column of their usage of YouTube, Netflix. Um, uh, and you can look at the daily use, but just look at how often they are using these particular mediums. And at the graduate level, as well. And as my staff has informed me, uh, YouTube, Pandora, Hula, Spotify, all welcome ads, okay? So you could do, are you advertising on these mediums now? If not, a handful of them are, are welcoming your, your uh, business, <laughs> okay? And then social media, it's Facebook and Messenger, it's Facebook and Messenger, the high, high yielders. So I'm just doing this because you know about newspapers and email and all that stuff, which you used to ask about, but these new social media and other forms of reaching out are increasingly important with this population. So we've given you our advanced knowledge on where to go to spend your advertising dollars, perhaps. And this is for Eric's.
Sorry about that. So there are two questions. Here. So after you answer the first one, if you scroll down, you will see the second one. Um, we'll just give this a little bit more time. Uh, the first question is about which platforms are you using where you have an active presence? And the second one is which platforms are you using where you're actually spending marketing dollars today? Mm -hmm. All right, looks like I'm going to go ahead and end the polling here and share the results. Uh, probably no surprise, um, Facebook is getting a, a very wow. large impression. Um, LinkedIn, I'm a little surprised that it's, and, and Instagram are a little bit lower than I would have anticipated them being. Yep. Okay. Okay, let me run through and how much, how many minutes do you want on this, Eric? <laughs> uh, yeah, we've got a couple of minutes if we want to leave some. some uh, okay, I do want to hear questions, so let me run through this, everybody. Okay, number one, age does not predict the way somebody learns, okay? So age-related programming, nobody says you got to be under 25 or over 25 to enter these programs anymore. Age is not a reflection of how people will learn. Don't use it as a determinant of where they can go and where they can't go. Location, location, and location. I said a lot about that. The nearer, the more likely you are to attract students, unless you are a huge name brand institution or you have programs nobody else is offering, or you reduce your price in a way that is so attractive they'll go anywhere to get to your program. Because the next point, cost makes a difference. I can't emphasize that enough. You have to think of ways of making these programs reasonable to these buyers at this point in time in their lives. Blended and online, that's it. Forget the classroom total. It's blended or online. And time to completion, let's get it over with. Look, these people don't want their summers free. They don't think May or January is a time to relax. They want 12 month programs back to back courses so that they can get out as fast as they can. I didn't put up the chart here, here about what percent of these post-traditional study full-time, but it's the large majority. Why? Because they have back-to-back -back courses, which gives them full-time equivalencies over the course of a semester, because they want to get over it. They want, they want to finish as fast as they can, and guess why? For that motive, we get the discussing over and over again earlier, I gotta increase my salary, I gotta make more income, and so on and so forth. So time to completion, lower costs, et cetera, all match. Uh, blended together to give you the right combination for your, maximizing your appeal. Is that the last one? Yes, great. So we've got a few, uh, few seconds here for some questions, a few minutes. Um, if you have any questions for Carol about, the, um, about the, the information that was in here or the larger one, if you can just go ahead and enter them into the Q&A now. Um, we'll go ahead and start to answer those questions. We do have a few that I'll go ahead and get started with here. Um, Carol, a couple of the questions it looks like are more about um, the methodology of the survey. Mm -hmm. um, where are, I guess we'll um, I'll ask the two questions here. Where, geographically, um, rural versus urban, um, is there any targeting that was used when you were um, uh, looking at the the students or surveying the students or were they just yeah, okay uh, I can I have a great detailed description of that if you want to get in contact with me but simply stated we do market studies all over the country for multiple colleges in their region we have a partner that is able to use a national panel of respondents where she can take her interviewers in and get a representative sample of what we're looking for just as an example of, of what we can we're, we're doing a a major study in a huge metropolitan area for nursing, 
okay? We are able to gather recent nursing students, current nursing students, or soon to be nursing students, to ask them all these types of questions for that client college. She had, so my, my partner has a national panel, and I can describe that in detail with you, that allows us to get the kinds of characteristics we need, like you studied in the past three years, you're doing it now, and so on, and it's this field or that field, and we can get the answers. It's a very detailed description. I'd love to send it to you if you contact me. Okay, um, next question. Um, what percentage of those that were surveyed were in online programs or looking specifically at um, online programs? I think we don't, uh, yeah, that we had, didn't we? That was one of the charts. I believe it's in more detail in the report, but um, yeah. I, can, I can try and see if we can go back to that. I, yeah, formats. Yeah. Go. Okay, uh, go back. That was it. That one uh, for undergraduate students. What they just did: all online courses, no visits to campus, was like thirty percent, and all classroom was seventeen percent. So anything with uh, online is eighty percent, right? Some mixture of online to totally online is eighty percent for undergraduates. And for graduates, it was 75%. Okay, next right. question. Um, do you think that 50 miles from a satellite campus is relevant, or is it only within 50 miles of the flagship location? That question comes from Jody. Yeah, my guess is of the satellite campus. Yeah, I would say so. It's a place where they go to get services, and they see it in their neighborhood, or their, it's connected to area employers. So I, I would say yes. Okay. By the way, you know, one, one, one recommendation that didn't show up here is increase your ties with area employers so that you can make connections for your students with them and they can give you advice of what needs they have and what subject areas that you can create programs for. Very important. Ties with area employers. Okay, and I know that um, you've been putting a lot of thought into how the, uh, the data that we have here from this survey is impacted by the, um, the current situation that we're in with COVID. Um, how do you see this change in, um, based on, on what we're going through now and, and how relevant do you feel like this data is now relative to um, the current situation that we're in yeah. and long-term? And um, if you could also just talk a little bit about how you've addressed that in the report as well. Yeah, my overall feeling is that it, it makes it even more relevant because I can see even now traditional students perhaps opting for these kinds of arrangements because their parents are saying, I'm not going to pay full-time tuition and we're not getting that discount and there's less financial aid. So stay at home, study in an area, institutions so this gets over okay and uh get what you need i think it's going to increase the demand for for uh post-traditional study formats is that what the question was yeah just if um if you believe that the the data is still relevant and how oh absolutely shift, um, yeah shift. now there are some traditional students that won't give up uh i was recently staying with my daughter out in connecticut and we had a couple of college kids helping out in the backyard and they can't wait to get back to campus and update their apartments and get going. They're not thinking of the implications that their colleges are thinking of right now and what's going to happen. They want the climate of that undergraduate uh, ambiance. Okay. Uh, but I'm not sure. And the next question that's been coming up over and over at, uh, in the Chronicle and everywhere else is, the liabilities that colleges might face if they do things too rapidly and don't have enough evidence of what is going to work well or not. Okay, along that same lines, um, Jamie wanted to know, um, hybrid and online have been the ideal formats for uh, the COVID pandemic situation that we're in right now. Do you see this shift to an increase in online over hybrid? Um, or do you think that there will be a blend of hybrid when you are um, 
when you are making the shift here? I have a feeling until we can make everybody feel secure in sitting in a classroom that online will probably dominate. But in the far future, as more and more colleges are able to secure, I was listening to the president of the University of Oregon and they're reshaping their classrooms, reshaping their lecture halls, uh, but that's, you know, nine to five, what happens thereafter? So I think, um, I think we're gonna be heavily relying on, on online for many institutions and careful, careful uh, execution of, of blended. Okay, next question. Um, do adults indicate they want online, but once they get into it, realize they prefer in seat? I well, that's been a study that yeah, study includes both current and recent students as well as prospective students. Have you broken that data down? Yeah, we haven't. We haven't asked them because the answer is simple. Would you prefer a classroom instruction with your your fellow students and a professor talking about or, or online? You know, if you prefer, I mean, you would prefer the interaction. You know, that's great teaching. Every faculty member will tell you that, right? I'd rather have them face to face. But what is feasible and what's economical and what can be done with enough safety is a different question. In fact, when I confront this question with a, a number of academics, I say, it's not just the classroom that they would have a preference for. It's what's the best form of, of, of education? Tutoring, one-on-one, -on -one, of course. So... It's not, that's not the right question in a sense, because ideally everybody would love to be face to face with a faculty member, but practically it's going, it's, you know, not feasible most of the time in the near future. Okay, we have one more question in the queue. Before we get to that, I just want to mention that um, we've had a few questions about both the report, the recordings and the slides. All of those will be made available to you. You should receive an email to me uh, from me Within 24 hours, um, we, we have the recordings posted. Once I've got the recording edited and completed, we'll go ahead and post that on the website and send you an email that will have a link to that. Great. With that link, you will find the recording, you'll find the slides and a copy of the report. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, if you don't see that in, in the next uh, day or so, please reach out to me directly. I'm happy to make sure that you get that. But uh, the answer is yes, we do. we do make this information readily available for you. Um, we're also happy to have further discussions with you about that. So if you have any additional questions or you've got a small group that you'd like to, um, to have a discussion with, uh, certainly reach out to us and we're happy to make that happen for you as well. Okay, uh, last question that we have here is, um, Carol, you mentioned uh, afterwards the, that partnering with local businesses was helpful for connecting students to possible career opportunities. How does this work with students who may be distance learners and unable to meet with a local business in person? Well, in our, in our online, co online college student study that we, we do every year and will be ready in June, even online students study within 70 miles of the institution. I study with an institution 70 miles of where they live. Does that answer the question? That is, the employers are the same. So it's, it's the only way the, the, the big time players, be they Purdue or Arizona or Southern New Hampshire, uh, keep and maintain their, um, their market numbers is because of uh, their reputation and their, their, the amount of money they spend on advertising but, and, and I'm not sure I haven't compared their cost to your costs out there in the regions, but I think that their enrollments have suffered in the fact that more and more colleges now are offered online. And if not, if the data show both in our online study and this current study that they are studying with institutions within 70 miles of where they live. So the area employers would be around your, you know, around the corner. Okay. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, that is our uh, last question. If you do have additional questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, uh, Carol's email address is cslanian at educationdynamics.com. My email address is emcgee at educationdynamics.com. You can also find us um, on LinkedIn and on our website. So thanks again for Great. coming and uh, we look forward to speaking with you again soon.